This presentation is basically composed of three parts. A quick review of how Cuba was prior to 1959, an outline of the events which took place following the revolutionary government takeover, which caused the parents to make the heart-wrenching decision of sending their children alone out of Cuba to the United States, and the Pedro Pan Exodus story. In the 1950s, Cuba was, socially and economically, a relatively advanced country, certainly by Latin American standards and, in some areas, by world standards. There is a belief that Cuba was one of the most underdeveloped countries in the world when the revolution took over in 1959. This is far from the truth, and following are some facts to show you. In terms of physicians and dentists per capita, Cuba in 1957 ranked third in Latin America behind only to Uruguay and Argentina, both of which were more advanced than the United States in this measure. In 1958, there were 35,000 hospital beds in the country, an average of one hospital bed per 190 inhabitants, a number which then exceeded the goal of developed countries. The United States had one hospital bed per 109 inhabitants in 1960. Regarding education, in 1958, Cuba was the Latin American country with the highest budget for education, with 23% of the total budget earmarked for this expense. The public school system employed 25,000 teachers, and the private school system counted with 3,500. Remember that at that time, there were only 6 million inhabitants in Cuba. Regarding literacy rates, between 1950 and 1953, Cuba was among the most literate countries in Latin America, ranking fourth to Argentina, Chile, and Costa Rica. On the eve of the Cuban Revolution, about 80% of Cuba's arable land was under cultivation or used for grazing, and domestic production supplied 70% of the country's food consumption. Also, in 1957, Cuba's income per capita was fourth in Latin America, and real wages in Cuba were higher than any other country in Latin America. But things were not perfect. In 1952, former Army, Army Sergeant Fulgencio Batista, who had been president of Cuba between 1940 and 1944, ran for president again. And, when it became apparent that he would lose that hotly contested election, he seized power through a political coup and became president by force. This led to a period of political instability, corruption, and unhappiness in the lives of the Cuban people, who for years aspired to a stable and democratic government for their country. Hopes of free elections vanished plus the normal aspirations and desires for an even better life, made Cubans listen to and believe in the promises made by the revolutionaries fighting and working in the mountains and in the cities to topple the government in power at that time. Fidel Castro took power in Cuba on January 1, 1959. He was the leader of one of the movements against the Batista government. Cubans were jubilant. However, the new revolutionary government did not keep the promises it made while fighting to overthrow the Batista government. Instead, as soon as it took power, it began issuing decrees and creating arbitrary laws that in effect took away people's liberties and basic human rights. For example, individual liberties were abolished incarcerations for political reasons without due process. Just suspicion of counter-revolutionary activities would land citizens in jail. Summary executions took place, again without due process, and some political trials and executions were even televised during prime time, and free elections never took place. 
The government created committees for the defense of the revolution on each block. They became the eyes and ears of the revolution. Cubans were expected to spy among each other and report to the government on the daily lives and anti-revolutionary feelings and activities of their neighbors, colleagues, friends, and family members. Even suspicion of anti-revolutionary feelings and activities resulted in harassment and could land people in jail. An environment of fear and persecution was felt everywhere. I remember when adults were waiting in line at the grocery store, they knew that they had to be careful not to say anything negative about the government, because if the wrong person heard them, that could result in getting picked up and jailed. And this spilled over into the children also. I remember, especially at my grandparents' house, in the backyard and in the front porch, being told not to say out loud anything I had heard from my family about the government because that could cause my family to get picked up and taken to jail, and who knows what else. The atmosphere of harassment was everywhere. All independent news media were slowly taken over and eventually became under government control. A sure sign of the type of authoritarian government that was taking control of the island. Pre-Castro Cuba had 58 daily newspapers of differing political hues and ranked eighth in the world in the number of radio stations. Other violations of human rights and civil liberties. Some of the following laws and decrees were not impacting the children directly. However, they were impacting the parents and, and their ability to support their children and to provide for their future. And, most importantly, they were all in clear violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and were signs of the type of authoritarian and totalitarian government that was taking hold of the island. The National Institute of Agrarian Reform was established. The government expropriated privately held land holdings of a certain size and distributed them to farmers who then had control of production but not of ownership. The Urban Reform Law was nationalized all privately owned residential rental real estate. Therefore, all privately held rental property became part of the communist state. Cuban currency was changed. Each citizen was allowed to change only 200 pesos. Anyone with a bank account could change up to 10,000 pesos and then take out only 100 pesos per month. Needless to say, this impacted inheritances and savings people had accumulated in their lifetime for things such as their children's future and retirement. All privately owned Cuban banks were nationalized. Large foreign companies were seized. For example, American sugar mills and foreign owned oil refineries were taken over by the government. Eventually, all private businesses of all sizes were nationalized. Cubans were prohibited from freely traveling abroad unless they had written permission from the government. Many Cubans were made to relinquish all possessions, including their homes, in exchange for permission to leave. Also, special permission was required to return to the island, so if you left, you could not return freely. Government repression increased. For example, Public religious services were banned. In September 1961, the traditional religious procession to celebrate the Day of Our Lady of Charity was interrupted by the government with violence. In the March 3, 1961, United States Catholic newspaper The Voice, an article states that two nuns and a group of schoolgirls were arrested for collecting money for the needy of a parish in the Havana suburbs. After being held for a number of hours, they were released. The article offers additional details. The article goes on to say that in another instance, the Castro government ordered the removal of posters announcing the annual Catechism Day in a Havana suburb. Government seized all private schools and intensified Marxist indoctrination. 
In June 1961, a new education reform law was established. It stated that education is the responsibility of the revolutionary government, a responsibility it must not delegate nor transfer. Therefore, the communist government assumed sole responsibility for the education of the youth. I remember being schooled the day that it was taken over by the government. The militiamen came in, going in and out of all the rooms as if they owned the place. The nuns were really stunned. My sister and I came home nervous and upset. We knew that from that day on, things were going to be different in our school. That was the last day we attended school in Cuba. The photo you see on the left is of our school. Alphabetization Journeys for Cuban Youths Schools closed for eight months so the government could restructure its new education system and implement its new education reform law. During this time, the government also created the literacy campaign to teach peasants and others to read and write. Youths were encouraged to go on alphabetization journeys without adequate supervision far away from home. La Cartilla was the teaching manual used in the literacy campaign. La Cartilla was used not only to teach reading and writing, but also to teach the students and the youths teaching them the new revolutionary government politics and the new revolutionary way of thinking. Some of the chapters in La Cartilla were La Revolución, or The Revolution, Fidel es nuestro líder, or Fidel is our leader, La Nacionalización, or Nationalization, and El Imperialismo, or Imperialism. Cuban youths were sent to the communist bloc countries for long periods of study and indoctrination in the communist ideology. According to the January 27, 1961 edition of the newspaper The Voice, Castro announced the creation of children's farms where Cuba and the Soviet Union would exchange a thousand youngsters to work and learn on each other's farms. Many of these children in their early teens or younger would not be returned to Cuba in months or even years. Youth paramilitary organizations were established by the government through the schools. In addition to training the youths on the new revolutionary government way of thinking, in these organizations, youths were expected to spy and report on their parents' daily lives and on their parents' anti-revolutionary feelings and activities. Three of these groups were Círculos Infantiles, children up to five years old, Unión de Pioneros Rebeldes, ages 6 through 13, Asociación de Jóvenes Rebeldes, ages 14 through 21. Some organizations even trained youths to operate rapid-fire automatic guns, supposedly to defend the country from enemy attack. It should be noted that, while activities and initiatives such as the youth paramilitary organizations, the alphabetization journeys far away from home, and the long education and indoctrination assignments in the Soviet Union were not mandatory at the time, parents not in favor of their children's participation in them were seen as uncooperative with the new revolutionary government, which placed them in an unfavorable situation which many times included harassment. Patria Potestad proposed law rumor. A draft of a supposedly proposed law of unknown origin was distributed around the island which said that the Cuban government was planning to take away the Patria Potestad from the parents. Patria Potestad is the term used to describe the parental rights over the children. While causing serious concern and distress of the stress of the parents to think that this proposed law would be passed, this was not the only reason why parents made the heart-wrenching decision to send their children away. The spirit of that proposed law was already being experienced in Cuba. For example, closing of the private schools, the new education reform law, alphabetization journeys, and children being sent to the Soviet Union. Parents begin to look for ways to take the children out of Cuba. Until the children could safely return to Cuba once the communist dictatorship was toppled, because most parents did not believe the Castro government would land in power long, or 
until the parents could reunite with their children in the United States. Many parents adopted a wait-and-see attitude before beginning the plans to leave the island. Operation Pedro Pan is born. James Baker was the headmaster of Froston Academy, an American private school in Havana. In late November 1960, parents of Roston Academy students began coming to him, asking for his assistance in taking the children out of Cuba into the United States. Some of this, these parents were involved in the underground against Castro and feared that if they were imprisoned or killed, their children might suffer the fate of the Spanish children who during the Spanish Revolution were sent to Russia when their parents were imprisoned for their opposition to the government. Other parents, not involved in counter-revolutionary activities, were concerned about the increasing repression and indoctrination of the children by the communist government. Mr. Baker traveled to Miami and met with the former heads of large American companies in Cuba who were awaiting the time when they would be able to return to Havana to reopen their businesses. During these meetings, someone suggested that he contact Father Brian O. Walsh, at the time the director of the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami. Father Walsh had already been aware of the plight of the Cuban people and realized that among Cubans arriving in Miami fleeing the repressive government came children unaccompanied without their parents. He tells of a boy named Pedro, whose parents had sent him alone to the United States to live with a relative. But the relative couldn't really take care of the child, so the child went from one house to another until someone took him to the offices of the Catholic Welfare Bureau, where Father Walsh was able to help. Father Walsh also tells, tells of a lady who came from Cuba with her two children and turned them over to the children's court in Key West. She had to return to Cuba to continue her work to overthrow the communist government, but she wanted her children to be safe. The Plan in Action Baker and Walsh met in Miami in early December 1960. The plan was that Baker in Cuba would send Walsh in Miami through embassy pouches the names of children whose parents wished to take them out of Cuba unaccompanied to escape repression and indoctrination. It has been reported also that, in addition to documents being sent via embassy pouches, KLM and Pan American pilots used to carry documents under their caps, risking being caught and suffering the consequences. Walsh would begin the process of obtaining the student visas through a local high school and would secure places in Miami for the children who had no relatives or friends in the United States until their parents arrived in Miami or until the children returned to Cuba once the communist government was toppled. Walsh also obtained approval from the United States government to use federal funds for the care of Cuban unaccompanied minors. On December 26, 1960, the first Pedro Pan children traveled alone to the United States using student visas. The number of unaccompanied children begins as a trickle. Half of the ch children were met in Miami and stayed with relatives or friends. Remember, Cubans began leaving the island as soon as they saw the type of government that was taking over their country. So by the time the first unaccompanied children began to arrive in Miami, many already had relatives or friends that they came to live with. Children without family or friends in the United States were placed in group homes supervised by the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami, led by Father Walsh. In one of his writings, Father Walsh describes how he had to really look around for places for the first children to stay at. He got lucky that the Assumption Academy's boarding school was empty during the Christmas holidays because the students were there were away for the holidays. So the mother superior in charge gave him permission to bring the Cuban children temporarily until he found other accommodations. The first arrival stayed at St. Joseph's Villa, a Catholic shelter for homeless children, which had empty beds at that time.
And here we see photos of St. Joseph's Villa and the first Jesuit, Jesuit boys' residence. End of the plan. On January 3, 1961, United States-Cuba diplomatic relations were severed. The United States Embassy personnel was downsized to a minimum and stopped issuing visas. With no more U.S. V visas being issued, no more children could leave Cuba for the United States. Therefore, it seemed that the unaccompanied Cuban children's exodus would be coming to an end. In one of his, in one of his later interviews, Father Walsh said that when this occurred, he thought to himself, well, at least we tried. In early January 1961, James Baker joined Father Walsh in Miami to help find a new solution to the problem of the Cuban children. Initial solution, to send the children to the United States via Jamaica. The British authorities in Kingston were willing to grant student visas to those entering under the Baker Walsh plan because they knew that the children would not remain in but only pass through their country. In Jamaica, the children would be given visas to travel to the United States. The Catholic Bishop of Kingston secured lodging for the short stay the children would be requiring. In mid-January 1961, the United States State Department invited Father Walsh to a meeting in Washington to discuss a new solution to the problem of the unaccompanied Cuban children. At this meeting, the United States State Department authorized the Catholic Welfare Bureau in Miami to issue visa waivers to the children in Cuba. Here's a photo of Father Walsh and Abraham Ribikoff, the United States Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in early 1961. Here are samples of visa waivers. Visa waivers allow the children to leave Cuba for the United States without a visa. A steady stream of children continues arriving in Miami. Most children were met at the Miami airport by George Gwarch, a Catholic welfare employee who made sure the children were well taken care of and took them through the immigration process. Then he would take to the camps or group homes those who had no family or friends meeting them at the airport. During the first few months of the exodus, Mr. James Baker, the former headmaster of Ruston, Ruston Academy, also met and took care of the children at the airport. He was assisted by a group of volunteers headed by former Ruston Academy teacher Margarita Oteza. Mr. Baker was also one of the first house parents of the unaccompanied Cuban children's program. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion in April 1961 increased government repression and the fears of parents of losing their children to the go communist government. Castro mobilized all available forces. Men as young as 14 and 15 years old were mobilized and deployed in the battle zone. During the invasion, around 200,000 individuals were hauled away at gunpoint, taken into trucks, and packed into open courtyard, courtyards of jails, stadiums, and theaters. Many of these people were released after two or three weeks. A lot of them were parents who realized that all was lost and decided to save the children first. That is when Operation Pedro Pan really kicked up into high gear. Priests and nuns were forced to leave Cuba. With the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, the nationalization of the large private school system in Cuba, communist indoctrination instituted in all schools, the new education reform law, the alphabetization journeys away from home, the education and indoctrination assignments in the Soviet Union, and the expulsion of most of the priests and nuns who had been educa educating a large number of Cuban children in the private schools, parents had no choice but to find ways to get the children out. During the first four months of the operation, which was between December 1960 and mid-April 1961, less than a thousand children came under the program. <music> 
After the Bay of Pigs invasion, during the following 18 months, over 13,000 children came under the program. In December 1961, Castro indicated that for many years he had been a Marxist-Leninist and would be for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, there was a large underground movement inside Cuba to get the children out. Visa waiver distribution continues throughout the island at a faster pace, and a large group of courageous people inside the island distributed the visa waivers. This distribution was led by Miss Penny Powers, a British citizen who was a key player in the initial Jamaica visa program due to her contacts with the British Embassy and then with the entire operation. She had been involved previously with the Kinder Trump Sport Program, which got the Jewish children out of Nazi Germany into Britain. With the Kinder Transport experience, she was instrumental in assisting with the organization of the visa waiver distribution movement inside Cuba. Pancho and Berta Finlay. Mr. Finlay was the general manager of KLM in Cuba. Dr. Sergio and Serafina Higuel. Sara del Toro de Odio. Albertina O'Farril. I had the pleasure and the privilege of meeting personally and interviewing Ms. O'Farril. Polita Grau, Ramon Grau. Polita and Ramon Grau were the niece and nephew of a former president of Cuba. And others that we may not even know about and who are known only to God. Now the children's exodus goes into overdrive. About half of the children arriving in Miami had friends or relatives meeting them at the airport. And the other half were met by employees and volunteers of the Catholic Welfare Bureau and were taken to group homes and camps established by this organization led by Father Walsh. Following, you will see photos taken in some of those camps and group homes. Here is the Jesuit boys' residence. Here is St. Raphael's Hall. Here is Kendall Camp. Florida City Camp. Matecumbe Camp. Opalaca Camp. And Whitehall Group Home. Because the number of children arriving daily in Miami was very large, group homes and other shelters reached over capacity. Therefore, Father Walsh reached out to the Catholic dioceses all over the United States to find homes for the children who kept arriving unaccompanied. Thus, licensed care facilities in over 100 cities in over 35 states were made available. Then the children began to be transferred to these places all over the United States, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Here are children in Syracuse, New York. And here are two Pedro Pan sisters with their foster parents and foster sisters in Boonton, New Jersey. Here are Pedro Pan children in David City, Nebraska, and in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This is the Immaculate Heart of Mary home in Buffalo, New York. This is the orphanage where my sister and I lived before transferring to the foster home. And here are Pedro Pan children in Colfax, Washington. During the October 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, the world was the closest to a nuclear war than it had ever been before. Following discussions in the top echelons of the United States government, the United States decided on a blockade of the island to stop further military equipment from reaching Cuba from the Soviet Union. The United States and the Soviet Union reached an agreement where the Soviet Union would be willing to remove the missiles in Cuba in exchange for a promise by the United States that they would not invade Cuba. And now you ask, how did this affect the Pedro Pan exodus? Well, all flights between Cuba and the United States stopped. Therefore, 
no more children nor adults could leave the island for the United States. Some people did leave and reached the United States via third countries, but not many were able to do this. So this was the end of the Pedro Pan Exodus. And not only did this affect the exodus of unaccompanied children, but the parents of those children who were already in the United States were not able to travel to reunite with their children. Needless to say, the uncertainty of the future and of the plans for reunification of parents and children was devastating. By this time, 14,048 children had left Cuba for the United States without their parents. Of those, 6,486 received foster care on their arrival or shortly thereafter. The door shut policy resulting from the missile crisis lasted nearly three years. It ended with the Freedom Flights, which started in December 1965 and continued for eight years. Most of our parents came this way. Parents were given priority one, and within six months, most children were happily reunited with their families in the United States. The flights continued, yet many parents, especially those from professional groups, were held back hostage in Cuba and were not allowed to leave. Some were harassed and made to work in the fields in exchange for permission to leave the island. Others could not leave for other reasons, such as loyalty to their own aged parents, political imprisonment of other family members, or military service of other children. Who were the Pedro Pan children? They came from all races and classes of society, but the majority were the children of middle-class families, most of them attending private schools in Cuba. Most were between the ages of 12 and 16. Seventy percent were boys over 12. The majority of the 14,048 children were Catholic, and there were 396 Jewish, 700 Protestant, and others with no religious affiliation. Funding for the care of the children with no relatives or friends in the United States was provided by the federal government through the services of the following. Catholic Welfare Bureau, Children's Service Bureau, which is a Protestant agency, Jewish Family and Children's Service, United Highest Service, which is the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Florida Department of Public Welfare, and many others located in over 100 cities in over 35 states, the District of Colombia, and Puerto Rico. Why the name Pedro Pan? The Miami news media coined the term as an analogy of the Disney character Peter Pan, the boy who flew to Never Never Land. Jim Miller of the Miami Herald and Ralph Rennick of WTVJ Channel 4 were the first ones to use the term Operation Pedro Pan. Pedro Pans no doubt had a rough time adjusting to the new culture, language, and being away from their families. However, they pulled through and flourished in their new country, thanks to the values inculcated in them by their parents, the values of family ties and traditions, love of country, the importance of obtaining an education, and a strong work ethic. This is also the story of the sacrifice the Cuban parents had to make by sending their children alone to a foreign country to save them from the horrors of the dictatorship in the making. They certainly had to take a leap of faith to save their children from the communist dictatorship which, take, which was taking over the island. They are the true heroes of this story. Pedro Pans today are like brothers and sisters. We like to get together to reminisce, exchange stories about our Pedro Pan experiences, and to make new friends. Operation Pedro Pan Group, Inc. is a charitable organization established in Miami in 1991 by a group of Pedro Pans. To obtain information about this organization, please go to their website at www.pedropan.org. The Miami Herald Pedro Pan Network is an interactive database created by the Miami Herald. Here, Pedro Pans register, 
post their stories, photos, and other information about their Pedro Pan experience and about themselves in general. To see this database, please go to their website at www.miamiherald.com forward slash Pedro Pan. Most Pedro Pan archives, documents, and memorabilia are kept in three places. The Barry University Archives, the University of Miami Library's Cuban Heritage Collection, and Florida International University Special Collections Archives. Here are some of the sources used for this presentation. And thank you for your interest in our Pedro Pan Exodus story.